Hello, um, this is Charles Vanover. And I'm Paul. Uh, and that is Paul Myhouse. And um, we are doing a video on a planning tool for qualitative data analysis and interpretation. Um, we have taken, we've adapted this slightly um, from the section introduction for our first section um, from our new book with Johnny Saldana, analyzing and interpreting qualitative research. Um, I am a um, associate professor at the University of South Florida. Um, in addition to um, my other works, I have, um, have a new book on one of my plays that we're still working on. Paul, what do you, Paul, I'll give you yourself your introduction. Sure. So I'm the uh, assistant director of education and qualitative research at the Odom Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. And do you want to start? We can just start right now. Great. So I will begin sharing here. So one of the first things that we wanted to point out is that every qualitative study is a journey into the unknown. But this is a very complicated kind of claim because um, we, we, do, we do sort of have knowledge that we draw from. And I think a question to ask is to what degree is your study an exploration and to what degree is it anchored in literature or in some kind of theoretical or conceptual framework. But regardless of that, any kind of study that we're doing is sort of entering a moving river and no matter how much we want to nail things down, once we're in the field, the things are constantly shifting. So even though a lit review might situate, situate us, um, the realities of the field resituate us depending on what is happening in, in the living now, to use a term from Max Ben, Max ben Nannan. So this is um, one thing to consider. Are you prepared for um, being attentive to these shifts? Are you, are you um, able to be flexible in regard to data collection and as you move into the, um, the analysis phase? And you might even want to do a memo on, on this question of the unknown and your comfort level or what you're anticipating regarding this idea of the shifting sands of research. To make this journey successful, we uh, almost have the tools for the job and the skills to use them well. And this particular uh, webinar is presenting a, a tool for planning for analysis. So this is kind of anticipating what lies ahead and kind of getting situated in the, in the early part of this journey so that when you get into full-blown analysis, you won't be completely lost. Charlie, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Okay. Um... I am going to share my screen. I'm going to click down. And, um, and so getting completely lost during data collection is not our subject. Um, so what we focus on in our book is the time after the, the material comes in, after you've done sort of the heavy lifting of the interviews, but the time I think that both me and Paul believe really make or break a qualitative study, um, which is after the interview is done, when you've come home with um, your interviews, your artwork, your photographs, your videotapes, all of that content. And it had it been when I was a graduate student, people still really came home with big boxes of stuff, right? They came home with piles of cassette tapes. They came home with um, 20 rolls of film, five paper journals, artwork, laptop, floppy disk, um, um, film that had been developed, film that had not been developed. And so then the real struggle begins when you have to say, here's all this stuff. How do I weave it together to make a qualitative study? So I have these interviews, but how do I translate all of that content into writing? That's the subject of our book. 
And right now we just want to give you um, a really simplified nuts and bolts planning tool for the less conceptual work, right? The work that, um, you know, easily can get put to the side, but that um, can make such a difference in terms of the quality and then especially the time. So we met, imagine all of you, um, there you are with all of your stuff, right? Right nowadays, it might be all in the cloud. You might have so much content. So again, how are you gonna funnel down all that stuff into your writing? How are you just gonna organize it? How are you gonna to pull together that material? Because every qualitative study is unique, we can't tell you how, right? What we can tell you is that's an important problem for you to think through and for you to um, understand. And so in this tool, we just wanna give you a set of questions that can help you get going to envision, how do I get all of this material that I have collected, these wonderful interviews, these incredible photographs, these really incisive videos, um, this artwork, how do I transform it into a finished study, into a dissertation, into a book, into a set of articles? And so that is our tool. And so one of the things like I recommend is to go maybe a little old school and you know, think about maybe some of this you write by hand, some of this you memo either directly on paper or into your computer, but it's nice to really think through um, to have a record of your ideas so that you don't forget. So you keep thinking about that content. And, um, and so the first thing is, um, you know, in, in conventional non-qualitative research, your research questions and your resumption not only drive your analysis, your, but they limit it, right? One doesn't go beyond the experiment. One doesn't go beyond, one attempts to falsify, one attempts to predict. But in qualitative research, both guided by our questions, and then we're always on the lookout on whether those questions have actually led us to more important questions. But still, we always have to really keep referring back to those questions as guides, as pathways, as means of sort of aligning all of the different phases of our work. And so one thing is just write them down, put them in front of your desk, put them on your computer home screen, and you know, keep looking at those questions. And also just if you're having trouble acknowledging what your assumptions are, look at your research question closely and the, the research question itself, how you framed it, can reveal things that you're assuming. If I have a question like, um, how do social activists gain momentum in virtual settings? When I use the term uh, social activists in a research question, I'm assuming that there is that, that, that identity, that social activism is not just an action, but it's a type of person. And so even just that noun, social activist, in a question, in a research question, suggests that you are thinking of that as an identity. Um, so look at, look at the language of your question and, and, and ask yourself, what does that suggest about your current assumptions? Another example might be, how do, how do parents with children in the military experience post-traumatic growth after the death of a child in combat? Um, so that idea of post-traumatic growth that comes from post-traumatic growth inventories that have been developed in, in, in fields like nursing. And so again, when, when we're using a language like that, you're, you're drawing from what you already know 
And what, do, what are those assumptions doing for the study, for the research question? You might even in some cases want to uh, back up and maybe reframe the question if you want it to be more exploratory. Yeah. And, and that's why we have this question that I've um, borrowed from Mark Bagley, uh, what you need to unlearn or unknow. Um, there might be some assumptions that are getting in the way of your exploration. And so you might want to, again, kind of question um, your, the, your current um, um, uh, assumptions and in, in your current um, framing of the study and think about uh, opening that up perhaps and letting other things enter the, the research setting so that you can more closely inhabit the, um, the life world of the participants. And then again, part of the importance of the tool is that you get records of this process so that you know where were you at the start of my analysis. And that's a very important time, right? I've done my field work, I've done my interview. Here's sort of what I think, but our assumption through our book with Johnny Saldana is that one learns through analysis, right? That by transcribing, coding, memoing, doing art space practices, writing up, that all of the pieces of your analysis allow you to and that it's really valuable to keep track of that growth, to keep track of those different ideas, because then that can be material for your writing later on. And then again, just the nuts and bolts practical. What are your data, right? Um, on the one hand, as we said, we're not telling you how to do a qualitative study not even telling you how to analyze your data. What we're trying to tell you is, how do I pull this stuff together? What is my just core goals step by step as I'm doing the concepts? And so we really, again, my recommendation is, you know, what do I got? Do I need to go back to the field and find more stuff and have really a sense of, you know, Am I finished? Do I need to do some extra? How is my focus groups if I'm doing focus groups with my analysis? But really try to get a good sense of what are those next steps for my data? And then um, here is just, I think one of the biggest time savers, the biggest gifts that you can do to yourself, do for yourself is to take time right after, hopefully during data collection, but especially after, and really think about where does everything go on my computer? Do I have a really good set of files so I can go from interviews to photographs to that? If I'm using qualitative software, now is the time to really you know, do just the maintenance, get everything in its place so that you suddenly, you know, at 12 in the morning, you're not searching for that memo. You're not searching for that photograph. You're not searching for that, um, you know, that interview you did early on before your major data collection. All such things is just to really get everything well organized so that you can you, know, you build your tool chest, you build your desk. Oh. Yeah, you might also not only develop a, a storage system, a data management system, but also um, keep a memo or a matrix explaining what that system is. So that matrix, for example, could have a column, which is the data collection episode itself, the name of the file, the, um, the audio file, where it's stored, the um, the identified word file where that's stored, the the uh, field notes and the the document reflection memo if there is one. So all those things are associated with that one data collection episode. So where are each of those things being stored? If you have that all in a matrix, you never have to wonder because it's all there. So you know as soon as you kind of figure out that strategy, then you need to a matrix or a memo to make sure that you can go back to to that kind of blueprint so that you can always find things. Or if you're on a team, it's especially helpful so that team members know where things are. Yeah, and try to think about, you know, 
where are you going to file things? Where is it going to go? As you create these memos, as you create these codes, as you do all this work, um, qualitative data analysis software greatly simplifies the process, but it doesn't solve it all, right? There's always going to be, you have to be intentional. And so really thinking about, you know, good data management early, um, again, it just saves so much time later on because you'll forget. You don't think you will, um, but you will forget. Another issue is making sure that you have your multiple backups, right? Um, so backups in the cloud, backups on the computer, backups on the hard drive. But remember, they all have to be IRB compatible. So really thinking through how do I back all this material up? How do I back up as my analysis as I'm doing it? Those are just really critical um, questions. And again, um, IRB, so important to always have that present. This is what I promise these people. Um, am I following my professional responsibilities? Am I acting in an ethical manner given these demands? You can also consider uh, the, life, the, the lifespan of your data because you can archive data um, at, at places like the Dataverse at the Odom Institute. And this is where you would have to approach the IRB to, to get their permission to archive data and, and to create a study and, and get the um, um, consent of participants. But the point is here that you have to kind of anticipate these things um, ahead of time. And it's, it's really fantastic if you can um, have give other people access to your data over time because it doesn't just live in, in this one little a project that has this longer lifespan, which is a way of really contributing to the larger community. And in our book, we have a chapter about um, secondary data analysis. So using those archives by Cheryl Chatfield, um, which I thought is just a very important chapter. And remember that you have to actually ask IRB to you, for yourself to archive the data, right? So, I mean, whatever you do, never allow your data to lapse. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you, if you're a working researcher, you will want to come back to your dissertation data. You will come back to those early studies and you have to make sure that you can do that. You have to follow the procedures and anonymizing the content, creating the pseudonyms, doing that work early so that you're building these resources later that will um, I really think greatly help your career. My career is, is completely dependent on the fact that I, you know, I got my people I work with to say that they would archive their data and allow me to work on it for 50 years. So I just, you know, going around trying to figure it out. And that um, those long time stretches really work well for qualitative research. Um, it's just really part of our practice. Again, very different than experiments, which come, um, which are trendy and you know come quickly, come obsolete. Um, in truth, but qualitative research, the human experience does never come obsolete. In our, view. and then really thinking about um, the practical, how much time really, how much money really, and how do I really do this, right? Um, it's hard. Um, invariably, you will want your analysis to expand to more time than you give it. And it's really important to give it its time. Um, qualitative research is not an answer, right? It's a rich flow of meaning that comes from you know, your engagement, your interpretation, your work, and you have to give it its time. I've heard um, researchers like M Margaret Sandalowski um, say that analysis takes three times as long as data collection. And so just consider that, that those proportions. I mean, uh, you have to really make sure that you can uh, inhabit analysis and not just rush through it. And so um, 
kind of th think about your calendar as you map out your study. And think about, I mean, if you want to engage with the transcribed data, which we strongly recommend in our book, that takes time. If you want to code, you know, both deductively and inductively, as we discuss in our book, that takes time. Every piece takes time. And you can never be certain, you know, this time created this wonderful insight, but the wonderful insights are not going to be as rich if you don't take the work. And then here, one thing I just in editorial is that for many research, beginning qualitative researchers, particularly in areas where people are not used to qualitative research, they will find themselves held to schedules that are for surveys for experiments where there isn't much analysis afterwards, where you get your survey, you get your data, and if, you're, you know, if your predictions are correct, if you've nullified the null hypothesis, or falsified the null hypothesis, you're done. But for qualitative research, that's where the real heart and soul in our view, even though we've written a book about data analysis, um, really resides. So really think about giving yourself that time to, as Paul just said, you know, inhabit that data. There's just no substitute for that. And then um, remember just who do you got to tell about things? Can you put that, make sure that you tell people the things that they need to know about you so they don't have to ask? Like really being well organized, being on time, if things go long, if you can, you know, clearly explain and anticipate, um, everything will move better. And um, and so then here is just some nitty gritty stuff um, that I certainly think are really important. Is you know, your whole dissertation can stop if you can't get a committee sig member signature because they're on sabbatical. Right, you can, and so knowing when people are on sabbatical, when people are available, what's the best time to engage with them? Where's your time to degree requirements? What's your dissertation credit hour requirements? All of that, you know, nuts and bolts stuff that can, getting that right can save you time. Not getting that right will create hardship. And so really, um, again, like we can't tell you your university's dissertation policies, but we really think, get it on a calendar, make sure I can see it, make sure I don't forget, make sure I'm really thinking through all of these hooks and ladders. Anything about dissertation, Paul? I don't have anything to add. And then for here, for me, um, you know, I'm, I did the tenure track. I have tenure. I'm an associate professor, We're moving towards full, all such things. Um, and just to say, um, the pace of life on the tenure track is unbelievable, right? Um, you get to the university. Um, I got here in Florida in August. I bought a house, right? I'm bought a car, everything's changing. And then I got two and a half years, less than that, two and a quarter um, to make it to my full, to, to make it to my three year week. It just goes, the time goes by in an instant. And so really understanding, well, it's a three year review, but when do the, when do the committee members need to see those papers? You know, when when does this work actually need to be shipped out to people? And then when does, um, in what state do they wanna see? What's their expectation for your productivity? Um, something that again is, it, the time just goes by in a second. And, um, and then how do you file amendments if lo and behold, um, that paper was accepted, you know, a week before the committee meeting. That, and that really does happen. Um, 
really thinking about how do I manage this process? Can I get these dates and deadlines? Can I really understand these procedures so that I'm just not like, you know, here in the headlights and then, oh, well, I was supposed to send, I was supposed to do, now it's the committee is meeting. Same thing for your six year, your tenure at my university, it's a six year. Um, you have to be way early for your external reviews. So really understanding those timelines, um, I just think is very critical. And, um, and so again, like um, really thinking about, is this going on? Is this working? Am I going on time? Am I behind? Knowing if, that if I'm behind early, then how do I manage it? What do I do to simplify? Do I need to dig deep? What do I need to do? Um, you know, and keep coming back as we said at the start to those research questions. Where am I in the analysis? How close do I feel? What can I write up? Where do I need to keep digging? Am I surprised, right? Am I surprised? All those questions um, need to go on. And then as Paul would say, where, how am I memoing through that process? records of my creating as I'm engaging that'll allow me to come back and again give me new insight. I'd like to say just a word about about memos here. So if you are doing memos throughout the process then you then you have a body of, of um, writing already to draw from. And so think about memos as a kind of intellectual bank um, um, which is what Adele Clark calls it. And that can also help you develop your writing voice and to get some stuff down on paper from the very beginning. Yeah, and in our book, um, you know, we have two great pet, pet, um, chapters on memo writing from Paul and Elaine Keene. We have 24, 25, I think, chapters um, that really take you into step-by-step step the different parts of the analysis. Right, so we just want to, and different ideas on how to do things. So we well recommend it. We spent a lot of time editing it, working on it. We really enjoyed it. We just really enjoyed the process. Um, we just learned, or at least I learned, just a tremendous amount um, from working with people and from working and writing up the chapters. And. Um, we also wanted to end, um, most of these are contributors to the book or people that we wished were contributors. So um, Kathy Shermez um, died before we started writing on it. Um, but her voice and her vision really moved throughout um, the chapters. Um, and then for these others, we have a Sally Kalmuk Gallman's um, Book on data analysis is a wonderful, wonderful um, piece and should really inspire people as Jessica Goulian's. Um, and then for a new book right out, um, Paulus and Lester, who have a chapter in our book on how to do use qualitative software, how to manage the digital issues. So there's a lot of resources, a lot of ideas. Um, you know, we have at the bottom two really great works by Johnny Saldana and by Matt Almas. It's a last work. Um, the coding manual is just such a wonderful guide. If you are coding in your analysis, you should have that book. We have six chapters in coding. They're really great. Combine them with Johnny's book and you're gonna be ready for it. You'll be able to do that part well. Um, Savannah so Amastas take you through the qualitative journey and give you a lot of ideas. As does Patricia Levy's research design book, which I like um, because it gives a lot of, you know, it's very, it celebrates the diversity of the 
really helps people think through, you know, out of their silos and broadly about the things. Anything else? Any words to end, Paul? I don't think I have anything else, Charlie. Thanks.